All right, well, thank you for being here. We are now in the book of Judges in our 66 book series. Judges is a continuation of the story of the Pentateuch and Joshua. We saw, we're going to do a quick review of the necessary details to set the table, set the the scene for judges to understand it rightly. We saw in Genesis 12, God call Abram from Ur, and then in Genesis 15, God made a covenant with Abram and his offspring. He promised descendants with a number like the stars in the sky, and then he promised his offspring a land. But Yahweh wouldn't give Abram and his offspring this land immediately. Genesis 15, 7 through 21. He said, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur to give you this land to possess. Know for certain, he said to Abraham, that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, afflicted 400 years, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. Why would they have to wait? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. To your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites. Things would unfold exactly the way that sovereign God saw fit. And in his patient wisdom, he would delay judgment for the people of the land in order that Abram's offspring could be protected and grown up in Egypt, then rescued from Egypt, and be God's holy instrument of divine judgment on the wicked inhabitants of the land that God had promised to his people Israel forever. God will always keep his promises, whether it's to judge or to bless. But sometimes his time frames are different than ours and different than what we expect. Remember, it's in the context of judgment and promise keeping that Peter reminds us that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and the thousand years is like a day. So God accomplished exactly as he promised through Genesis and the dramatic story of the Exodus. We heard about that, him rescuing the people out of Egypt, and then he confirmed his promise with a warning to the people in the wilderness at Sinai. If they do not obey God's command to destroy the inhabitants and instead make covenants with them and allow them to live in the land among the Israelites, they would be a snare to Israel. Exodus 23, 23 through 33. When I blot the Canaanite out, God says, you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possessed the land. I will set your border. I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out, and I shall drive... You shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. God promised that he would give them the land little by little with the intention that Israel would replace the wicked inhabitants of the land that God had patiently waited to judge. God's people were to be characterized as set apart, holy, serving Yahweh with love from the heart. They were to replace the people of the land as Yahweh worshipers. And if they remained, the people and their gods, Yahweh warned, would surely be a snare for his people. They could not coexist in the land together. The book of Judges is the telling of the story of how just a few generations after these words in Exodus, Israel fell into this exact trap of compromise, allowing the people to remain in the land, and then Israel serving their gods, 
and Israel ultimately degenerating into a nation filled with the wickedness that met or possibly exceeded the nations they were sent there to remove. That story of degenerating compromise is the story of Judges. But before we get there, the story goes on from Sinai with Moses. Moses' next generation, or Moses' generation didn't trust and instead complained. They had to wait. That entire generation died. And then the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua begins with the death of Moses. And God did with that next generation exactly as he had promised. Dramatically, the next generation, under the leadership of Joshua, in faith in Yahweh, made dramatic inroads of conquest into the promised land. Joshua is an amazing book, and it's filled with conquest of the land, destruction of the people, not perfect obedience, but generally reaching a climax of, of excitement and expectation of what would happen next. Though the land has been divvied up, though, at the end of the book, and there's been many dramatic victories. Um, the conquest isn't yet complete. It started out well. And you'd almost expect that the book that would follow would be a continuation in the likeness of Joshua. One story of success after another after another until the people were displaced from the land. And you saw a land filled with Yahweh worshipers, much like you would anticipate from the Torah would exist. Joshua ends with Joshua 24, God declaring, it was not by your sword or by your bow that I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. You see, the story of Joshua was not the remarkable story of a powerful army but it was a story of a faithful God keeping his promises to a largely obedient generation. And God gave this land to his people to replace the idol-worshiping Canaanites in the land. His people were to be different. The plan was the same as it was to Moses, the same as it had been to Abraham. The people could not serve both Yahweh and the gods of the people they were replacing. The Israelites were to replace the people Yahweh drove out in judgment, not become like them. They were, were to replace the gods of the people with worship and service to Yahweh. The people of Joshua's generation promised to do this at the very end of that book, just before Judges. You can see that in Joshua 24, 14 through 18. They say, now therefore, Joshua says, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity. Put away the gods that your fathers served and serve Yahweh. Choose this day who you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve Yahweh. And the people answered in agreement. Yahweh drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will also serve Yahweh for he is our God. Joshua ends on a high note. The people, one, acknowledging that Yahweh was the one who gave them the land. It wasn't their might, their power. It was Yahweh. And they promised that they would serve Yahweh, that they would continue as they'd started the task of taking over the land in order to replace the godless, idol-worshiping Canaanites with a holy people devoted to Yahweh. But Yahweh was gracious to warn them. And the people acknowledged that warning and the promise. They promised, we will serve Yahweh for he is our God. Yahweh warned through Joshua. He warned Joshua 24, 20, foreboding premonitions of the things that would come. He said, if you forsake Yahweh and you serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. In Joshua 23, 12, if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you, and you make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that Yahweh, your God, will no longer drive out these nations before you. 
but they shall be a snare and a trap to you. Similar words as the warning to the Israelites in the wilderness with Moses. God will keep his promises to Abraham. God will keep his promises to Moses. He'll keep his promises to Joshua. He kept his promises to, keep the, to bring the people into the land, but he will also keep his promises to discipline the people when and if they forsake Yahweh and serve the other gods. Judges tells the story of how Israel forsook Yahweh, served their gods, and God stopped driving the nations out. The people became just like the wicked Canaanites that they were supposed to replace, and then even worse. But Judges also tells the story about how God was faithful to his promises, and he did not utterly forsake his people. He disciplined them, but he refused to let them be destroyed. He saved them time and time again, despite themselves, by sending them judges. And he sustained the people in order that in days to come, in days that are still not yet here, he might be faithful to all of the promises that he has made. So there's some quick background data on the book. I feel like we're ready to now jump in and understand the book of Judges with that context. When was the book written? We don't exactly know. There are six references in the book to things that exist or still called something to this day. So the book was written in a time where the effects of the, de- of the events of the judges were still, still in effect. They could still see the things that were talked about, at least some of them. Um, there's also a common refrain in the end of the book. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. That seems to indicate that in these days, there is a king in Israel. So it was probably written at least after the kings, after the monarchy, at least after Saul. But the fact that there's such a focus on Judah makes you think it probably was written at least after the founding of of the Davidic monarchy. There are, there's at least one, probably two references to the captivity of the land, which makes me think that the book was likely written or at least took its final form after the captivity of the northern tribes, after they had slipped into a similar people of the land mimicking godlessness. Regardless, this was a history book for Israel to learn where they had come from, why things were how they were, and just like it can serve for us as a warning An example and a warning, it served as those things for the people of Israel to whom the book was written. Regardless of when, it's obvious that the book was written to defend Yahweh against accusations that he had failed his people. You see this throughout the Bible countless times as the people say, it looks like your promises have failed. I would have expected things to go this way? Why are they this way? You actually see that question lodged against God in the book by Gideon and others. Um, And if it was written in the time when the northern tribes were being exiled, a similar question might have arisen. Or even if it was in the time of the monarchy and you're wondering, why are we in the state we're in? I read the Torah. It looks like things should be different. Well, let me tell you about the situation that we got us in. And it God's incredible patience and faithfulness to even sustain us in this state. And we see the importance and scarcity of generational obedience. You see that consistently throughout Scripture, and that should be a warning to us here, too. It's rare that you see generations stacked on generation of faithful people. We see cycles of one generation being at least somewhat faithful, followed by subsequent generations completely falling away. Finally, we see the importance of leadership, the need for good leadership to point people towards Yahweh. Judges is a potent warning of the wickedness of the human heart. The book gives a history of how Israel devolved through compromise into apostasy effectively becoming like or even worse than the Canaanites they were sent in judgment to displace. And we see the mercy of God to treat his covenant people 
with mercy. When people forsake God in his clear revelation and follow their hearts, doing what's right in their own eyes and going against God's word, the result is inevitable. And it's what we see here, a decline into degeneracy, suffering, and the wickedness of the world around. You've seen that countless times throughout the ages of people once faithful to God through compromise generations later, moving so far from the foundation on which they rested that that they're nearly um, unidentifiable, sometimes even worse than the world around them that God saved their forefathers uh, to be different then. Finally, we see God's undeserved mercy poured out on an undeserving people, not because of who they are, but despite it, so that God's purposes and election might stand. So I have an outline. We have, the book is broken down into really just three parts. And if you think of this, when you read it on your own or as we go, I'm going to follow the same outline. There's three very distinct portions of the book. The writing is different. The purpose is different. We have chapter one through beginning of three degeneration through compromise. It really serves as an introduction and explanation for the book. Three through uh, chapter 16, the cycle of the judges, the part of the book that you're most familiar with, the stories of the judges, the, the exciting part. And then 17 through 21, degeneracy culminating from compromise. The nation is worse than the nations they were sent to displace. It's a tragic climax that shows a glimpse into the daily life of Israel, and it feels like we're back in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Israel has effectively become the Canaanites. So let's get, let's finally open your Bible to Judges 1.1. 1, 1. We're finally there, Judges 1.1, 1, 1, and it begins with the same words as the book of Joshua. That should trigger in our mind, this is a sequel. Like if two movies start the same, Um, these two books start the same, and and they're clearly connected. Joshua begins with the words, after the death of Moses. Judges begins after the death of Joshua. And after the death of Joshua, the people inquired of Yahweh. They're doing the same thing that they had been doing in Joshua. They said, who shall we go up first to fight against? Which one? Send us. And the people start out well. They ask for Yahweh's guidance. This is the last time in the book until the very end that all of Israel is together asking God something. And you'll see the tragic thing that they're asking God for at the end. They ask, who who should go up? And Yahweh says, Judah shall go up because I have given the land into his hand. This is going well. This sounds like, if you didn't know where it's going, this sounds like it's going to be part two of the exciting conquest of the land. But compromise begins immediately. So they, uh, Judah goes up and they conquer a king, Adonai Bezek. What were they supposed to do to him? They're supposed to kill him. Instead, they already start mimicking the people of the land. In the land, when they conquered people, they'd humiliate them through maiming them, cutting off apparently thumbs and big big toes. Do the same thing. Didn't kill him, maimed him. And Judah, as a result, could not drive out the inhabitants of the land. It says because they had chariots of iron. You'll see later that does not stop God. The people of Benjamin then did not drive out the Jebusites from Jerusalem. So, the people of, so they live with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Then when they were supposed to go conquer Bethel, or Bethel, the, the city that Jacob named Bethel, the house of God, place where Abram camped when first arriving in the land, and Jacob dreamt and God re- renewed his covenant. When they were going to conquer that place, they made a covenant. The first thing they did was, maybe we don't have the power to conquer it. Let's make a, let's make a covenant with somebody who's going to give us the secret on how to get into the city. They let him live, and he rebuilt a city, named it the same thing, and it existed, Luz, in the the land to that day. Immediate compromise. Look how the author shows this. If you look at 127, you'll see very clearly that the the author meant to communicate this 
descent into, uh, into compromise. They compromised by letting the Canaanites live among them. They made them their slaves. You could see the logic. We shouldn't kill them. We should just use them to work for us. 128, Israel grew strong. They put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. So what happened 129? The Canaanites lived in Gezer among them, among Ephraim. 130, so the Canaanites lived in Kitron and Nahalal among Zebulun. They're supposed to drive them out, and instead they let the nations live among them. Look at how that devolved. That compromise led to Israel living among the Canaanites. The Canaanites were among Israel. Now Israel's among the Canaanites. 132, the Asherites lived among the Canaanites. 133, Naphtali lived among the Canaanites. Finally, 135, there were regions where Israel couldn't even live in the land that God had promised. Dan was pushed back, 134, and the Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Harry's. Dan, looking for land, will come back to haunt them at the end of the book. God gave the command, drive out. And seven times the author said, Israel did not drive out. This was not Israel's, this was not a failure of Israel's ability, but it was a moral failure resulting in compromise. And the reason they could not drive out was because Yahweh stopped driving out the people just as he had promised he would if they associated with the people of the land, made covenants with them. God was keeping his word. Undoubtedly, the next generation was wondering why their fortunes were so different than their parents. Well, did God break his promises? Why, why are the things that my parents talked about not happening? Gideon later expressed that sentiment. We'll get into that when we hear his story. But then chapter 2. Chapter 2 starts with Yahweh himself through a prophet answering, or through uh, the angel of Yahweh answering that question. Why is this happening? God himself in human form, as he appeared to the patriarchs, then to Moses in the bush and Joshua before entering the land, comes here, the first of many appearances in the book, to speak to his people. In chapter 2, he offers his own explanation of the people's failure to drive out the Canaanites. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. It's because God is keeping his promise that we read in Joshua 23. Judges 2, 1. Yahweh declares, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. That was what we were supposed to get from chapter one. They went into the land, this new generation after Joshua died. They didn't obey the voice of Yahweh. What is this that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you. But they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you, just like had been promised twice before to the preceding generations. No, God has not forsaken his people, and he will never break his covenant. His people have forsaken him, and Yahweh did exactly as he promised. Think back to Joshua's admonition to the people to not forsake Yahweh. Warnings of what would happen if they did, and the people's commitment to follow. What happened? Well, the author of Judges tells us next what happened. 2 6. It's a rehash, a flashback. Joshua died. It's a commentary on the statement of, of the angel of Yahweh. Joshua died, and then the people of that generation died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know Yahweh or the work that he had done for Israel. The plan in the Torah was clear. The plan for God's people is clear. Deuteronomy 6, 
Yahweh declares, so that it may go well for you in the land that Yahweh has promised to you. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh your God, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart. You shall teach these words diligently to your children. And when Yahweh your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers with good and with great and good cities you did not build, take care lest you forget Yahweh. This wasn't going to be take care you generation, but take care people generation after generation. How would that happen? By teaching these things diligently to their children. Judges 2, 10 through 12, there arose another generation after Joshua who did not know Yahweh or the work that he had done. And, the peop- and then the people of Israel did the evil in the sight of Yahweh and served the Baals. The effect of the next generation not knowing Yahweh and the things that he had done was that they immediately turned to the Baals. They abandoned Yahweh. And you'll see this throughout the book. Obedience, even partial, rarely lasts beyond one generation. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down with them and provoked Yahweh to anger. I'm so grateful that we named our kids' ministry Next Generation Ministries. I pray that the echo of Judges 2.10, the warning here, would be etched in my heart, your heart, the heart of this church, to see what happens, what can happen when the generation that follows a faithful generation doesn't know Yahweh. And I pray, I beg that our, our church and our efforts at guarding our hearts as a precursor, necessary precursor to shepherding our homes and as a church, making sure this next generation in NGM, student ministries, they don't ride on the coat, the coattails of the generation that went before. They don't enjoy the blessings of Yahweh on our generation and respond in disobedience, but that they would know Yahweh for themselves. That we would be the kind of church and the kind of households that are faithful, that are faithful to make the way of God, the way of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, known to them, that it would be a place that the Holy Spirit would love to use to save these kids, and that we would be faithful, diligent to pray for them and lead exemplary lives that they would mimic. Let's get back in. Um, we're going to run out of time if I don't pick it up. 2.11 through 3.6. We now have the author of Judges gives really the outline for the next section. This is one of the things that Judges is famous for, the cycle of Judges. You see a six-time six cycle. I'm sorry if you can't read this. I will read it to you. There is a cycle that happens over and over again. Starts with Israel doing what is evil in the Lord's sight, in Yahweh's sight. It actually says Israel did the evil. It's not just any evil or evil things, but it is that they turn to the false gods. They turn to the gods of the nations around them. And God's anger is then kindled, and he hands them over to the enemies around, just as he'd warned. That's number two. Number three, then Israel cries out to Yahweh, And Yahweh raises up judges who saved them. And then five, the oppressing nation is subdued before Israel. And then the land has rest. And then the judge dies. You'll start to see this pattern devolve. Not all of the aspects will be there as time goes on. Um, And we'll see that that's part of the story. Each time it happens, the text says that the people did the evil right? The evil worshiping the false gods. And in each successive judge, uh, there is, each successive judge is more and more morally corrupt, less godly, and a less imitable leader for the people than the one that came before. This is a helpful diagram. Um, 
It's, it's from a commentary by Daniel Block, a, a helpful commentator here. And it, it just shows uh, in your mind these aren't, oh, it's not the same cycle over and over again, but you see there's a purposeful decline. The size of the circle is roughly how much of the story is told about the judge. But you see the first ones, judges aren't too bad. They do pretty, pretty well. They, God is raising them up. They call the people back. There's rest in the land. But by the end, by Samson, the people aren't even crying out for help. There's no rest in the land. And I don't think there's much godliness at all to be found in the judge Samson. So the story is told, the story of judges is told as a narrative. And I'm going to seek to do the same for the rest of this message. I'm going to tell the story. We're going to necessarily skip over some parts. But let me commend to you the reading of the whole book in one sitting, if you could. I've done that a number of times, obviously preparing for this. Depending on how fast I read, it would go between an hour and two, never more than that. Certainly not longer than a movie that you would sit down to watch. And I promise you that this book contains more action, plot twists, irony, violence, excitement, tragedy, and even sadly more moral debauchery than most anything you're going to find on Netflix. I've read it with my family. I've read it alone. It's sobering. It actually is a really, really good read. And even better than that, it's a divinely inspired, perfectly true story. One that actually happened. And in God's providence, these things took place as examples for us. And they were written down for our instruction so that we might not desire evil as they did or to fall into the trap of idolatry, sexual immorality, or the other temptations and allurements of the world around, calling for them and us not to look different. So Judges 3.7, the descent of compromise of the judges begins with Othniel, it starts with, God left the Canaanites in the land in order to tempt the people to see if they would obey. Yahweh wanted to give an opportunity for the next generation to know war, to conquer land for themselves. He didn't want to wipe out everything all at once and have cities uninhabited, overrun by animals. He wanted each generation to have an opportunity to be obedient But instead of conquering them, that generation intermarried with them, made covenants with them, and before Yahweh's very eyes began worshiping the false gods, the Baals and the Ashtaroths. And in in anger, Yahweh sold Israel into the hands of Cushan Rishathayim, the powerful king of Mesopotamia, the land that their father Abram had come from. And the people cried out to Yahweh, to save them. And mercifully he did. And he raised up Othniel, the son of the faithful spy, Caleb's younger brother. This is in the early generations. And by God's merciful protective hand, under the leadership of Othniel, Cushim or Shathiam was defeated. And the land had 40 years of rest, approximately a generation. And then the next generation grew to adulthood. And again, they did evil in the sight of Yahweh, worshiping false gods. And in order to discipline them, this time Yahweh caused the king of Moab to rise up against Israel. Moab's king was a very fat man named Eglon. And he ruled Israel for 18 years. Then Israel cried out to Yahweh again for help. And ironically, from the tribe of Benjamin... Benjamin means son of my right hand. God raised up a left-handed man named Ehud in a memorable way. The people of Israel had to bring tribute to Eglon. And Ehud came with an entourage with a group of people carrying tribute. And after delivering it to Eglon said, Eglon, I have a message for you from God. We're going to let our 
Your guards step out. I'm going to send my people away. It's a secret message. And Eglon came in close to hear the message. And Ehud, from his right thigh with his left hand, pulled out a two-edged sword that he made and thrust it deep into the belly. The fat rolled over the double over the, the hilt. Probably from the smell, the guards thought, oh, they're done talking. He's relieving himself. All the while, Ehud made a getaway. And he declared to the people, he declared, follow after me, for Yahweh has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. Yahweh raised up a salvation for the people who cried out from this judge, this savior, Ehud. And like that, the nation turned to follow Ehud and Yahweh, and they routed the Moabites, killing them all, 10,000 able-bodied men. And Israel had relief for 80 years, this time two generations. But when Ehud died, the people again did the evil in the sight of Yahweh. So Yahweh sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, and his army commander, Sisera. And after 20 years of cruel oppression, the people cried out to Yahweh for help, and he heard. And through the prophetess Deborah, Yahweh raised up the next judge, Barak. Yahweh gave command to the people through the word of the prophetess, and they did as Yahweh commanded. 10,000 people from Zebulun and Naphtali followed Deborah and Barak, And despite Jabin and Sisera's iron chariots, superior technology, and greater numbers, Yahweh routed the Canaanite armies, said not a man was left. And to add humiliation to defeat, Sisera died just as Deborah had prophesied at the hands of a woman. Jael hammered a tent peg through Sisera's temple as he lay hiding inside her tent on the run from Barak and his armies. Chapter 4, verse 23. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. Was this going to be a continuation of the conquest of Joshua? Had the people finally learned their lesson and returned to Yahweh after three times repeating the cycle? Well, the land had rest for another generation, 40 years. And then chapter 6, a generation later, the people of Israel again did the evil in the sight of Yahweh. And so Yahweh gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. God's people this time actually found themselves hiding out in caves. They couldn't grow their food out in public because every time they did, the Midianite raiders would come in and steal it. And it's in that context where we see Gideon um, he's hiding from the Midianites. And the angel of Yahweh shows up. First, Yahweh sent a prophet to, his, to proclaim to the next generation. So before, before the angel came to Gideon, Yahweh sent a prophet to all the people to tell them why they were in the situation they were in. And that prophet said, Thus says Yahweh, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt and gave you this land. I said, I am Yahweh, your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites, but you have not obeyed my voice. And then, like I said, the angel of Yahweh appeared to Gideon as he hid, a not particularly impressive man from a weak clan from Manasseh. And the angel said, Yahweh is with you. Gideon responds, not knowing to whom he was speaking. He said, please, my Lord, if Yahweh is for us, then why has all this happened? Where are all his wondrous deeds that our fathers told us about? Now Yahweh has forsaken us. Gideon didn't yet understand that Yahweh had not forsaken them, that indeed it was Yahweh there talking with him. 
and he would be about to be used uh, to strike a great blow against Midian to save his people. But once the angel of Yahweh caused the meat and unleavened cakes and broth to be incinerated with fire, Gideon finally got it. He knew who he, he was talking to, and he cried out, Alas, O Lord Yahweh, now I have seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. He knew that he was supposed to die. But Yahweh was merciful and replied, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon went, and at the command of Yahweh, he cut down the altar to Baal and the Astra that belonged to Gideon's own father. We get a glimpse of the normalcy of the evil that that was going on in the land. And the spirit of Yahweh then led Gideon, and he sent messengers throughout most of the tribes of the far north of the land to go out and fight against the Midianites and the Amalekites who came against them. God was gracious to Gideon's slow to believe heart by giving him multiple miraculous signs that he would be with him. But then Yahweh tested that faith. God wanted to make 100% sure that nobody could give Gideon the glory for winning the battle. That there was no denying that that this was the hand of Yahweh who had not forsaken his people as Gideon had proclaimed. If only the people would return to Yahweh, reject the false gods. He would drive the people out of the land, the enemies out of the land before them. He would be their God and they would be his people. So Gideon called to the tribes of northern Israel and 32,000 willing men came. Still was going to be tough against the army of at least 135,000. The Midianites and the Amalekites. They were outnumbered five to one. But Yahweh said, too many. Send away any who are scared. 10,000 remained. Too many. The army was further whittled down to just 300. 300 against an army of 135,000. So that 300-man army split into three and then surrounded... The, uh, surrounded the, the armies of the Midianites and Malachites. And at the command of Gideon, they smashed their jars and they yelled, a sword for Yahweh and for Gideon. And then they watched as the Midianites and the Malachites panicked and killed each other. God had not forsaken his people. He used a humble man of Manasseh on his slow to believe faith to lead a tiny army to watch the massive army kill each other. This was no great conquest of might by Gideon, but a gracious demonstration of of Yahweh's power and faithfulness to save his people. But Gideon instantly made this about him. As he was going out, he took retribution against a personal insult by killing the men of two cities, two of his, his two Israeli cities, his own countrymen in Succoth and Penuel. And his obedient battle against the Midianites, well, he further compromised there by, instead of fighting him with the 300, God said he would give it, said, okay, come help me, everybody. And then killed his own countrymen. He, his battle immediately devolved into one of personal vengeance against his own people. The land did have 40 years of rest under Gideon, but we can start to see the decline in the quality of leader. Sadly, Gideon's legacy was not one of Yahweh worship, but rather a priestly garment called an ephod that he had made from the spoils of war actually turned the people away from Yahweh worship. It says the people hoard after the ephod. A religious peace, quasi-Yahweh worship mixed in with, syncretistically with the people of the land and the people turned away from Yahweh to worship like the people of the land did. And then upon Gideon's death, his son Abimelech, the son of a prostitute Gideon had been with, wanted to succeed his father, so promptly murdered all of his brothers, all 70 of his brothers but one, started a civil war, 
and ended dying by a woman dropping a millstone on his head. The cycle of judges continued. God saved them, but the people didn't truly repent, and the nation continued the downward spiral. Unsurprisingly, you can anticipate what came next. 10.6, the people of Israel again did the evil in the sight of Yahweh. This time, you might notice they never stopped. It's not rest. Now, there's 40 years of rest, but characterized by um, godless leaders. 10.6, the people of Israel again did the evil in the sight of Yahweh, this time serving not only just the Baals and the Ashtaroth, but every false god they could find but Yahweh. Judges 10, 6 through 7, the people of Israel again did the evil in the sight of Yahweh, served the Baals, the Ashtaroth. Check this out. The gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. They forsook Yahweh and did not serve him. So Yahweh's anger was kindled against them and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. Do you know what we don't see this time? We don't just see the people crying out. It got really bad for them. And it's, it's actually exciting. The people cried out for the first time with confession. Is this going to get better? The people said, we've sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. Maybe they'd hit rock bottom. And God replied in agreement and frustration saying, you have forsaken me and served other gods. Now, therefore, I'm, I'm going to save you no more. Go and cry out to those other gods. See if they'll save you. But the people knew those gods were helpless. So they cried out again, Yahweh, we have sinned. Please deliver us this day. And then it says they actually put away the foreign gods and served Yahweh. We see the tragic reality at work that reveals the human heart too often responds to God's blessings with disobedience. But we also see the way, the way that our gracious, godly Father, Heavenly Father works and superintends his trials for his people. God disciplines us for our good, for our holiness. So under God wrought oppression, the people turn, and God was merciful again as he saw the misery of Israel. So he raised up Jephthah, a mighty warrior, the son of a prostitute. As Israel further declined into wickedness, but maybe began to repent, at least began to confess, Jephthah led Israel against the Ammonites. But in the process, Jephthah foolishly and arrogantly vowed to Yahweh that he would offer as a burnt offering whatever came out of his doors when he first returned home, if only God would grant him victory. He won, he returned home, and his only daughter came out celebrating. So following his own wisdom and completely uninformed by God's word sense of morality and religiosity, looking a lot more like the human sacrificing people surrounding him than following God's law, true Yahweh fearing, which forbade such human sacrifice. He killed his only daughter to keep his vow. Then Jephthah further showed his true colors and godless intentions by murdering 42,000 of his countrymen from the tribe of the Ephraimites over a disagreement and personal slight. The plunge into the godlessness of the nation and the leaders continued. This time there would truly be no rest in the land. It says Jephthah murder murderously ruled Israel six years and then he died. Some other judges are mentioned, but again, no repentance, no Yahweh serving or peace in the land is mentioned. And then chapter 13, the people of Israel again did the evil in the sight of Yahweh. And the Philistines ruled them for 40 years on into likely the time of Samuel. There would be no salvation or peace from a judge this time. The people didn't cry out. They actually rebuked this man, this judge Samson, when he fought against them. Don't you know the Philistines are our rulers? They didn't cry out. 
but God still didn't forsake his people. Instead, the angel of Yahweh again came to a man, Manoah, and his barren wife, and he promised a son would be born to her who would save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. This man is none other than the famous Samson. He was to be a Nazarite to God, never cutting his hair. And it was said that the spirit of Yahweh would give him superhuman strength against his enemies. The story of Samson is one where Samson worked miracles of power for Yahweh while pursuing all manner of sin. With no care for keeping God's law, he freely made himself unclean and even worse, sought marriage to a Philistine woman because she was right in his eyes, even though expressly forbidden by God's word. And then when the Philistines kill her and her dad, Samson takes vengeance on them by catching 300 foxes, lighting their tail on fire, setting fire to their fields. He killed a thousand Philistine men with the jawbone of a recently dead donkey. And then this foolish, godless instrument of Yahweh that was wreaking havoc among the Philistines idiotically told the secret of his strength to Delilah, a Philistine prostitute who was clearly intending to seduce and trap him. Delilah then cut his hair. His strength from Yahweh left him. The Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. Finally, this last and most godless of the judges stood humiliated at a Philistine party to Dagon, their god. The Philistines were celebrating the apparent supremacy of Dagon over Yahweh, saying, our God has given our enemy into our hand. You would think that Samson might be brought to repentance hearing that, right? He might have righteous anger against the Philistines, mocking the supremacy of Yahweh. Maybe in passion to vindicate the name of Yahweh, the source of his power, Samson would call out for help. Nope. Instead, you might want to look at this, what he prays. He prays, O oh Lord Yahweh, remember me. And please strengthen me only this once, O oh God. Why? So that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my eyes. <laughs> That's where he goes. That's at this party of Dagon over Yahweh. Samson wants vengeance for his eyes. Not a care for Yahweh's name or evidence of repentance or sorrow, just a personal vendetta of vengeance. And Yahweh answers the prayer nonetheless. Samson's strength returns. And he's able to knock the whole building down by pushing on its pillars and collapsing the building on 3,000 Philistine men and women at this idolatrous festival. So the story of Samson ends, 1630. So the dead he killed at his death were more than those he had killed in his life. So we're now at the tragic end of the cycle of the judges. Samson judged for 20 years the people stopped crying out to Yahweh. No peace came to the land. The nation of Israel had become just as godless as the nations she was supposed to displace. And so had her leaders. Sets us up for the final chapter of the book, well, the final section of the book, chapter 17 through 21. The descending cycle of compromising judges has culminated climaxed in the degeneracy of compromise. We have a common refrain in this section. Four times it says, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We get some stories of religiousness in Israel having something to do with Yahweh but they're driven by each person's opinion or personal thoughts of Yahweh that there's no information being gleaned or dri driving the people's motives or actions or relationship to God. Nothing 
at all indicating that they had any familiarity with the Torah, any familiarity with all of the revelation that had come just generations before. The nation, it says, had no king. But the reality is the nation did not need a king to lead them away from Yahweh, though the leaders that arose weren't particularly helpful. No, each person's fallen heart, untethered to God's word, could do that very well on its own. But it did point to what the right king should do, lead the nation to Yahweh, keep them faithful to Yahweh, Through the time of the monarchy, we would see those kings were few and far between. But we do, on the sequel to this book, get the promise of the perfect one who would come, who would rule his people from the land, people with new hearts from the throne of David in perfect righteousness forever. But after a devastating descending cycle of compromising judges, the nation of Israel has tragically reached the pinnacle of godlessness. Here in these chapters, we have a story of a Levite. Remember who the Levites were supposed to be. They were supposed to be scattered across Israel. A tribe without a land for inheritance spread throughout the tribes, throughout the land of the other tribes, to lead them in worship of Yahweh according to the pattern given in God's word. Instead, now Yahweh is treated in the land as just one more God among many. And the people think, oh, maybe I have a Levite. That's one of those Yahweh people. I can serve the God of the Moabites, the Amorites, the Hittites. The, I'll have a Dagon guy and I'll have a Levite guy and we'll add him and maybe we can get Yahweh on our side too. So chapter start, 17 starts out with a man named Micah and some of the men from the tribe of Dan who you might remember never even got their land. And they're excited because they actually have a real, light, real life Levite acting as their priest. Maybe that would finally bring them God's favor. You see, they've added, they have some remnants of Yahweh worship and they've added that into the mix of their worship of all the other gods around them. This tendency to want to make worship of God fit in with the prevailing religious views of the world around us, it's not isolated to judges. You see it throughout history. You see it in our day. You see churches falling into this left and right throughout the generations, even in our time. I wish I had the time to go off on it, but you don't have to think hard to know of some examples of what I'm talking about. The people of Dan set up a carved image for themselves. And then they set up as priests to the tribe of the Dan. They set up this Levite as a priest to the tribe of the Danites. Um, And it actually says in the book that the the Levites served the Danites until the time of the captivity. And you see reference this in 2 Kings 17.33 that the people feared the Lord, feared Yahweh, but they also served their own gods after the manner of the people from whom they had been carried away. This scene of the Danites setting up a Levite never went away under the kings. It actually continued, we see, all the way until the captivity when the Assyrians finally pulled them away. And we see some fights over the Levites. And it's just sort of a sad story that goes nowhere that just shows God's people don't know what's going on. They don't know God. They don't know the way to God. And they have mixed Yahweh worship in uh, with the worship of the other gods around. But then we see the real climax of the story in another Levite, chapter 19. This Levite had a concubine. And he was traveling through the hill country of Ephraim on his way to Shiloh, where the house of God was at that time. And as he traveled, he was hesitant to stay in the city of Jerusalem, for that was considered a non-Israelite city due to the Jebusites who had reconquered it, apparently, from the time it was conquered in Judges 1. They instead pass on past Jerusalem onto the Benjaminite town of Gibeah. Surely they would be more safe with their own countrymen there than they would have been with the Jebusites in Jerusalem. 
In Gibeah, the Levite finds a hospitable host, an old man of the city who warns them, you better not sleep in the town center. It's a little reminiscent of the story from Genesis where the men of Sodom wanted to homosexually attack the two angels sent to rescue Lot. The Benjaminites from Gibeah demand, banging on the door, bring out the men, the man who just came into your house so that we may know him. And with twisted logic, similar to Jephthah's, the man of the house suggests that the people of the town do something a little bit less wicked. Here's my virgin daughter and his concubine. Rape them instead. Doing what was right in their own eyes, that made more moral sense. When you have a standard of morality based on doing what's right in your own eyes, you can justify all kinds of horrible things. It says in 1925, the Benjaminites knew her and abused her all night until the morning. In the morning, the Levite finds his unresponsive, dead, or dying concubine on the doorstep and carries her home. The wickedness in Benjamin had gotten too great. Israel had become worse than the nations they were supposed to replace, even as bad or worse than Sodom, the city God did not have the patience to wait to destroy, but instead sent fire and brimstone down in the days of Abraham. So the Levite says the nation must know about this and chopped his concubine up into 12 pieces and sent those 12 pieces along with the story of what happened to all of Israel. And now, for the first time, horrified, the nation is gathered together. For the first time since Judges 1-1, the nation of Israel is gathered together for a common goal. Judges 20, verse 18, in the same way that the book started, remember when the people asked who should go up for us against the Canaanites? Here, the tribes united in a civil war of quasi-righteous anger against their brother Benjamin, and they inquire of God, just like 1-1, who shall go up? But instead of who shall go up against the Canaanites, who shall go up for us to fight against Benjamin? And Yahweh responded the same way as he did the first time. Judah shall go up. This time he didn't say, I've given them into, my, into your hand. After some back and forth, the battle culminates in total slaughter of the tribe of Benjamin, save 600 men. Every man, woman, child, animal, city of Benjamin is destroyed. Ironically, what all of Israel was supposed to be doing all along to godless Canaanites, they only now finally do to their brother Benjamin. The other tribes then are all all the tribes but Benjamin in chapter 21 lift up their voices and weep bitterly and ironically asking, why has this happened in Israel that one tribe should be lacking? Well, because you just killed them. But they cry out, why? And you might think, oh, we know why. We've turned away from Yahweh. And national repentance happens. But instead of setting aside idol worship or seeking Yahweh for an answer. They take matters into their own hands and come up with a self-evidently horrible solution. They note that when they went to go kill their brother Benjamin, the people from Jabesh Gilead didn't send any people. So to avenge this lack of participation. They instead kill all in Jabesh Gilead except the virgin girls. The problem was there were only 400 virgins in Jabesh Gilead and there were 600 Benjaminites. Where were they going to get the other 200? So they say, well, there's a festival at Shiloh and there's going to be some girls dancing. If you hide in the bushes and steal them, and then when their, their parents complain, we say, oh, it's for the greater good. And the people of Benjamin did so, Judges 21, 23, and took their wives according to their numbers from the dancers whom they carried off. 
Then they went and returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and lived in them. And the people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Let's pray. God, this is your word, your patience with your people is amazing, and we dare not look at this and say these people are worse from the heart than any one of us. God, apart from your grace, we would participate in this godlessness with equal abandon and readiness. God, may this be a warning of the wickedness that is in our hearts and the gracious patience that's in yours, but in the reality that you mean it when you say that you will judge sin, when you promise justice and judgment and that your patience won't last forever if we don't turn, we ought to listen. And God, you are patient and you're gracious and you keep your promises. And to this people, just a generation later, you'd have a Benjaminite on the throne and then King David to follow. And then you'd make a promise for a king, a perfect king that would reign forever from that throne of David. A king, Jesus, who declares at the end of Revelation 21, I am the root and descendant of David. Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come.